Welcome everyone, I'm Philippa Jeffries and I'm here with Rajiv Prasad, also from Cybersecurity Magazine. And today we are talking to Roman Yampolsky from the University of Louisville about his research and thoughts on safety and security in AI. Uh, so welcome Roman, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. So I guess to kind of start off on this topic, AI is becoming ever more prominent in all industries and we're continuing to see innovation in this area. Um, but my, I guess my first question to you is, what kind of does safety in AI actually mean to you? What would you define as kind of the key features of a safe AI? So it really depends on whatever we're talking about systems we have right now or mm -hmm. predictions about future AI. So right now, people talk about problems with bias in AI, technological unemployment, things of that nature, uh, hacking of intelligent systems. Mm -hmm. My research is more about uh, what is going to happen once we get to human level performance and beyond. That's okay. where the system itself becomes an agent. And uh, like any other agent, independent agent, it could be unsafe. It could make decisions we disagree with. It could have side effects of its uh, decisions which negatively impact us. and. Uh, the progress will continue. It will not stop at human level. So as it becomes mm -hmm. what people call super intelligent, the impact will, will be complete. It will dominate all uh, domains of industry, including scientific research and engineering. And at that point, it's not obvious what we contribute to that equation. So when I talk about AI safety and security, I'm really concerned about how it will impact humanity as a whole. That's uh, that's interesting. In fact, uh, uh, just reminded me of uh, of an interview from Yuval Harari, uh, the author of Sapien, right, where he mentioned uh, that flaws can seep into in, into an automated uh, system and can be further expanded uh, through AI. Not these were not his words, but you know, it's more mm -hmm. or less implied that. And that, that is uh, obviously quite interesting. I mean, uh, automation and then uh, coupling that with AI. Um, so would you uh, envision that there would be some form of standardization that allows um, control or regulation uh, and standardization that would allow control over how the, the solutions are being developed and deployed? Or is it just too fragmented at the moment? So this is the big part of my research, uh, control and regulation. Uh, we can look at previous examples of attempting to regulate IT sector um, governance of these technologies. The big examples for me are computer viruses and spam, right? Okay. We have legislation, it's illegal, but I don't think it makes any difference whatsoever. We have too many viruses and spam is still dominating my inbox. So it doesn't seem like simply saying it's illegal, don't do it, makes any difference in reality. It's good security theater, everyone feels good about it, government gets lots of money allocated for it, but at the end of the day, it doesn't impact technology. So it has to be something at the level of algorithms if we're talking about making it safe. The problem there is that we don't really agree on what it means to make it safe. Human understood terms such as good, beneficial are not well defined. They are fuzzy. And even if we mm -hmm. agree on what good is, which we never do, that's why we have wars and you know two party systems, uh, is very difficult to program that into computers. So even we agree on what values we want, what outcomes we want, actually programming it in is uh, extremely difficult, maybe impossible. Okay, and you also mentioned not just about safety, but kind of control of AI as well, and kind of trying to standardize that. What, like, what does it kind of mean to be in control of an AI system? Like, how in, tro in control can we be? Like, do we want to be? So, I have a recent paper where I explicitly look at different types of control. Mm -hmm. uh, we can start with explicit control where you give orders. Like, yeah. uh, if you think about stories about genies making wishes come true, right? I want everything I touch to turn to gold. And then the system <laughs> just does it and you go, oh my God, why did I wish for that? Let's undo that and wish for something else. It always just gets worse and worse. Then yeah. there is uh, kind of implicit, implied control where the system has a little bit of common sense that understands, okay, not everything should turn to gold. Just, you know, my money instead of being fiat should be Bitcoin, something like that. 
that's also problematic because now it has to interpret what you had in mind and maybe mm-hmm. it misunderstands maybe you're not sure what it is you actually want a lot of times we sure. are disappointed with our decisions uh the other extreme is where you have a much smarter system super intelligent system and you go mm-hmm. well the system is just so much better than me i will trust it to make all decisions for me and maybe they good decisions but you definitely not in control anymore mm-hmm. you are animal in a zoo and they take care of you Mm-hmm. So that's the extremes we're looking at and probably some sort of hybrid system where we have some impact and maybe can undo some actions but we are not explicitly in control is what we want but even that is not obvious. So it's interesting uh yes first of all thank you for just sort of categorizing it in such a way that it makes sense to a layman like myself. Uh so the implied control that is something we are already noticing right i mean in several of our depending on what kind of gps one uses but at least the ones i'm using every time i get on my car the car already takes a decision for me like okay so rajiv you're heading there because in the past you have done that or, or my phone tends to do that like okay it, it has sort of learned my routine and it just tells me i would say 7 out of 10 times uh, it is right because i have a certain pattern and It, it is not disconcerting, but it took me by surprise when when that started happening a couple of years ago, and then uh, and then I took it in a stride. It's it's there, and uh, might as well use it. But the one in the car is fairly annoying because it always sends me to my wife's old office. <laughs> um, and, and then of course we we have uh, we have heard of uh, GPS going wrong by not c- collating accurate data. So um so how do you see that how uh, how does as as a society we determine this is the right path or is it just a perfect market which will determine on its own accord So that's a great question and GPS is a great example uh when we want GPS to do good are we talking about for you for society maybe it's better to route you in a slower path and safe gas for society prevent climate change maybe we should be emphasizing something like that uh should you get priority over a ceo who's trying to make it to an important mm-hmm. meeting the more capable the system becomes the more complex this decision about who goes which way uh, becomes it's not as trivial as just solving traveling salesperson problem right you need to actually account for these other things and uh we don't really know what the right answer is us so uh, self driving cars are another example they can be programmed to save your life as a passenger mm-hmm. they could be programmed to save the most lives possible in case of an accident but who buys such a car right if a car is not looking out for my family i'm not buying it or i'm hacking it for sure so we have so many open ethical philosophical questions and very few solutions Um going back to kind of what you were saying about how our AI is potentially in the future developing towards a super intelligence where it kind of surpasses humanity. Um I was just wondering what your thoughts were kind of are we definitely heading that way or we close to that at all like kind of what stage is AI at? So nobody knows for sure right it's hard to predict especially mm-hmm. the future but it looks like we are making steady progress. and there is uh, a recent development where we basically see that just adding compute more computation and more data gives us predictable amount of progress and we can calculate just how much compute will need to get to human level brain emulation human level performance so it, it stopped being a question of if it happens when it happens and it's more like do we have enough money to make it happen today are mm-hmm. we willing to spend that many billions right now to train that system and the answer is still probably no it's expensive and we cannot guarantee the performance levels but it's very likely that it will happen it may take longer we may be surprised that there is some additional difficulties but uh, i think at this point almost everyone is convinced that eventually we'll get there whatever it takes 10 years 20 years or 50 years is a mm-hmm. different question we can talk about So I imagine uh, along these lines, right? Uh, if we are looking at uh, I forget the term right now. Uh, 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 if you're looking at utilities like energy, 
you know, the smart grids and more and more utilities are connected. Um, how, how can AI further optimize, uh, you know, attacks on these? And we have, ha we have had a few, at least in the US uh, in the past year. Uh, prevent cyber attacks on uh, our cyber infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, difficult because AI is now used as a tool to attack those systems, to discover zero day exploits. So essentially what we have is uh, arms race between mm -hmm. hackers and defenders and all of them more and more rely on automated intelligence systems for this process. Um, typically, it's uh, very hard to defend. As a defender, you have to consider every possibility. As an attacker, you just have to find one flaw. And a lot of times the flaw is a human operating the system. So social engineering attacks are the most successful, easiest to do, and now we can automate social engineering attacks. It used to be that you had to tailor it, study a person, mm -hmm. study their social networks, maybe you call them, it was very expensive. Now we can automate this process to where I can attack millions of accounts at once. We can have deep fakes of your video, audio, obviously text by email. So it's very hard for even trained professionals to say no if I get a video from my boss or my wife telling me what to do. It sounds real, it looks real, so I'm mm -hmm. gonna give them access to the account. And if I can attack a million accounts at once, and let's say just 1% says yes, I'm guaranteed access to whatever I want. Now, that definitely puts a lot of things in perspective. It, uh, then again, it just goes down to how we are experiencing uh, the internet it's, it's every time you're signing up to a new service you always for instance have this option where you can use your google account to sign up so and i'm sure a lot of people just to make their life easier opt for that one account that manages everything um so it, so yeah it's 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 a uh, it's a question of how much risk what is willing to take for uh for convenience um, as opposed to meaning that you have a username and password separately for each service and every account that you that you have in your life, right? Absolutely. And uh, centralized approach may provide very good security because we invest a lot in securing those resources. But if there is an attack, maybe insider threat, uh, then uh, everything is uh, open. They have access to all your accounts and. Google in particular is probably the number one AI developing company. DeepMind is probably the company which will give us AGI, give us super intelligence. So it's interesting that they already have all our passwords. Yes. I'm kind of looking at that kind of using AI used for cyber attacks. Um, in January, we, we did a podcast that was about um, using AI to detect cyber attacks within automated systems. I was just wondering what your thoughts were on that kind of the other side of it of using AI to defend against uh, cyber attacks. Well, you have to rely on AI. As a human, I cannot keep up with uh, live mm -hmm. streams of gigabytes of data. I cannot yeah, yeah, sure. over network traffic. I cannot read every white paper published on every exploit. So systems like, I think IBM Watson was at some point uh, supposed to be giving us this uh, additional capability of looking through all this data and providing convenient summaries. So as a human, mm -hmm. I can at least try to keep up with what's going on. It uh, can mark, you know, potential uh, areas of concern for a human to examine in some detail. So it's definitely a tool useful for cyber defense. Yeah. And should we be cautious at all though, relying on AI for cyber defense, or is it just kind of a natural progression, do you think? Well, you can do without, so you have to, but of course the system itself could be exploited. It opens mm -hmm. additional uh, path to, to attack the system so we can understand how it works and as a result train it, have some sort of behavioral drift where it stops recognizing intrusions if you slowly show it that it's a natural change in use patterns. So there are research on exploiting that as well. I'm always... I'm always curious about, um, we live in a globalized world, uh, in spite of the rhetorics, political rhetorics, and we are getting more and more inter uh, interconnected. Um, and again, it just sort of goes back to my earlier point and question to you about standardization. 
because that in some form allows everybody has a seat at the table, hopefully. Uh, but the way things are developing, I mean, obviously we are looking at fragmented world, right? right? Certain, certain regions of the world being more progressive would have more understanding, more know-how to work with it and to use it as a tool and others might be more passive in the way the AI specifically would be pushed towards, towards them. Um, is, is there thought given to that? Is that something... Uh, who should be thinking about this? Uh, and I and this is not to <laughs> suggest that you're supposed to give an answer to us <laughs> uh, exactly what what should be done. But uh, is there? Let me rephrase that. Is there a thought by companies like Google and others or uh, uh, IBM uh, regarding that, or is it a very commercial-minded dis uh, decision on how to proceed? with the technologies and how it impacts uh, different societies? So publicly there is a lot of talk about uh, including diversity, uh, cultural diversity mm -hmm. in AI, in values given to the systems. But the reality is uh, you have a few people, companies like again DeepMind, OpenAI, who are running experiment on 8 billion of us. None of us really consented to having this technology deployed and whatever it does to us is uh, unknown at this point, but that's the situation. I don't think there is any means to force uh, kind of sharing of how it's developed with everyone. And even if it was the reason our countries or cultures don't do that is because they don't have the capability. I mean, you can share the source code, but they still would not be able to meaningfully participate. They may not have the same computational resources, obviously, or just know-how for how to work with those advanced cutting-edge neural networks. Would you say that currently the kind of looking at the safety and control of AI and the kind of ethics of it is a priority for those developing these systems or not at the moment? It's a very interesting situation. So on paper, they say they are very concerned. They usually have some sort of a safety team. They publish on safety. They may have principles of safe development. But given that we don't know how to actually make systems safe, you would think they would slow down a little instead of trying as hard as possible to get there first. So mm -hmm. we have this uh, situation where the same person would be saying, Super intelligence will destroy the world and we're going to get there by Tuesday. It's going to be great yeah. <laughs> and maximize profit. So I still don't fully understand it. I think the argument is something like if I don't do it and the other guys will get there first and they are the bad guys. But uh, I think you'll just be the first one who has to deal with those problems. That's the only yeah. difference. That's kind of a common thing in technology though, right? The, the race is on often to get there first. The kind of looking more specifically at the ethics and perhaps the security of it comes a little bit later. And it worked historically for companies like Uber, Airbnb. You don't worry about the legal framework. You get there once you are a unicorn, you'll figure out how to yeah. pay the fines. But uh, AI is not a tool. It's an agent. It's a completely different situation, a game changer. And I think they're not account for that. I see papers come out about how to split profits after superintelligence. You really think that's going to be the big question, how to, you know, split uh, dollars the right way? Yeah, and I mean, obviously, you're looking into it and, and your group is, but how um, many people kind of globally are looking into kind of the ethics of this and superintelligence and, the, yeah, the kind of safety and control of AI? So there's definitely some growth in that field, especially in general ethics, less so in mm -hmm. superintelligence safety. Maybe we went from you know a couple dozen people to a couple hundred people, but still very, very few in comparison to hundreds of thousands who work in development. Okay, and kind of looking kind of to the future a bit more as we develop this AI, what kind of things would you hope to be seeing from these companies, these people developing the AI in terms of looking at the control and safety like what could we be doing to help this because it is a very tricky kind of uh, situation well, examples from other disciplines if you look at biology for example synthetic mm -hmm. biology we kind of agreed we don't know how to do human cloning right and so we yeah. put moratoriums in place we said let's figure it out before we make those monsters 
Uh, same idea might be meaningful here. Instead of trying to get there as soon as possible, slow down, try to utilize the technology we have right now and see if it's actually something we can control, if it will be beneficial or we're just, you know, in this spiral race to the bottom, whoever gets there first kills everyone. Yeah. Unlikely to happen, but I'm hoping. <laughs> And I'm just interested in your thoughts on, obviously, AI is a very hot topic. People are trying to use it for so many different things at the moment in so many different industries. Would you like to see a slowdown in that, or are you kind of pro kind of pushing it as far as it can at the moment? So there is a few domains where we really need AI. We need it for, for example, aging research. We can stop people from dying with proper... Mm -hmm investigation. I was kind of split on this because on one hand you can resolve all these existential risks, climate change, dying can be solved with superintelligence. On the other hand, it itself is an existential risk. It looks like you may be able to make good progress without getting to superintelligence. So something like alpha fold for protein folding allows okay. us to do the medical research we need without being that intelligent. So maybe we can still solve aging just with tools, not with agents. So that's my hope now. Maybe it's sufficient and we don't have to get to the uh, super intelligence level, which would mean we can have archaic and needed too. We can have cures mm -hmm. for diseases, cure cancer or whatever, and uh, not die from super yeah. intelligence. So uh, finally, I would like to uh, mention uh, another point, and again, it's a question, it's in a form of a question. So uh, when we uh, envision, and it's already happening, uh, AI in cybersecurity, it's, AI is not just being an agent for security, but it, it is, it can very well be, or may, might even be playing a role from the other side of the table, right? Um, so essentially, uh, is it is it too far fetched for me to imagine that humans are anyway being pushed out of the equation, <laughs> and and machines are playing that game? And of course, the the way it all manifests is we suffer our wealth. At least if, when it, if we're talking uh, financial institutions as an example, our wealth might suffer. Is is that what we're heading towards? Well, yes, there is automation of human labor in all disciplines. Some will be last to go, so probably those doing AI research will be the last job to be uh, fully automated. But definitely in cybersecurity, we see also not just AI used as a tool for enforcing it, but a whole switch to intelligent cyber infrastructure. We have blockchain with smart contracts where instead of making some sort of human deals in human language we have computational code is the law we have contracts which are enforced by algorithms and exploited by algorithms so the question becomes not so much are you hacked or not hacked but did you agree to a contract which was a mistake in the first place so you have this lawyers who now verify smart contracts and a lot of times billion dollar contracts have loopholes in them but the good thing is we discover them we patch them and now the system is secure so maybe we'll slowly switch our economy to crypto economics and it will long term provide more stability we're kind of coming to the end of our time but i just wanted to kind of end on one point um at cybersecurity magazine in the last year or so we've done a lot kind of looking at security awareness um not just kind of the standard you know passwords but just generally um I, yeah i was just wondering kind of what your thoughts are on this with regards to safety and ai like kind of for people whose data are being using by these are being used by these companies for consumers what should they kind of really know about safety ai so it's interesting to understand that what you do today will be actually judged by AIs of tomorrow, right? The encryption we have today will be hacked in 10 years. So anything you share today will become public. Anything you put in different isolated social networks, here you have a picture, here you have a video, here you commented, it will be brought together under one identity and somebody will look at it and analyze your complete uh, social online life. So 
the only solution right now, if you don't want it to be publicly known and analyzed and hacked, is not to put it on the internet. That's the best I can suggest for truly critical data. So separate your accounts into, ah, I don't care, use any password. Okay, somewhat secure. And then like things I really don't want out there, you just mm -hmm. don't make it at all. Yeah, and just to end on kind of a positive note, I guess, are there any kind of um, positive developments that you are looking at, that you're working on in AI and safety and security? So there is not any definitive breakthroughs, but we are getting much better at at least understanding what a problem is. And yeah. 20 years ago, we didn't know there is a problem. 10 years ago, we were kind of like, oh, there is a problem, but certainly this is how to address it. And now at least the landscape of different difficulties is better mapped. Doesn't mean we're done with that mm -hmm. process either, but at least we have some idea of what we're facing. Yeah, the step, first step is realizing there's a problem, right? <laughs> so Great. There's, there's, I think, uh, an addict, right? Where is known, 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 unknown, and unknown, unknown. Right. Yeah. And we're dealing with a lot of unknown unknowns, both positive and negative. So it could mm -hmm. be amazing things we can't even envision so mm -hmm. good. But at the same time, yeah. Well, we'll have to see. Well, unless anybody has any final thoughts. Um, and let's end it here. But thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me again.